okay, I realized that some of those did not look terribly realistic. But um, I hope you got the idea. How are you guys doing today? Cold. Good. Did someone say cold? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for your incredible love for us. We thank you for your guidance and how you put people in our lives that can really reflect you. And Lord, I ask that you help us reflect you. Help us to live our faith in a way that others can see you shining through. And Father, as we open your word today, I just ask that you would reveal it to us in a new and a fresh way. Help us to truly see you, your love, your heart, and what we need to do to truly be your representatives here on earth. Watchman Nee, the great Chinese writer, Christian writer, once wrote a true, about a true story that he knew of, of a Chinese farmer, a rice farmer. And where he lived was in an area where they, it was on terraces. And this farmer worked extremely hard every morning getting up, flooding his fields to grow the rice. But then after he would leave, his neighbor who lived down below, would open the dikes and allow all that water that this man had worked so hard pumping into his field to come down into his own field. You know, basically stealing the water. Now, this went on for a while, and the guy on the upper terrace was a Christian. And at first he didn't want to confront his non-Christian neighbor, but he's like, well, what am I going to do? My fields are dying. I, I need this. And so he went to his church. And he explained the situation. He asked them to pray for him. And they did. They, they prayed together and God gave them an answer. Maybe not the answer that you would think. What happened was, the answer was that this gentleman, this farmer, Christian farmer, was to get up earlier than usual. He would get up earlier than usual and he would go and he would pump water into his neighbor's yard. Then he would go and pump water into his own rice field. And this went on for some time. You know what happened? The neighbor couldn't understand it. Why didn't this guy retaliate? Why didn't he do something? Why did he in turn bless me? So he became really curious. And he started to ask his neighbor, well, why? And the upshot of it, of course, is eventually the non-Christian neighbor became a Christian because he saw Christ reflected in the life of this Christian farmer. Our memory verse is 1 Corinthians 12, 5. It says there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. And the thing is, is that we can serve God in a multitude of ways. A wide variety of ways. You saw in the video, and it was kind of a silly video in some ways, about people, though, serving God in a wide variety of ways. It doesn't have to be on a street corner or someplace. It doesn't have to be always something big. It can be small. But if God is in it, it can be used effectively. I want to talk today about ways that we can serve 
to exercise our faith in God and love for others in a very specific thing that we're going to call hands-on faith. You see, you can have faith. You can have a belief in God. But it can be very personal. It can be maybe never shared. That's not what faith is supposed to be. Our faith is supposed to be lived out loud, as we've talked about. Our faith needs to be hands-on. It needs to be in a way that is expressed, that people can see. Because if they can't see our faith in action, then how do they know it's real? There are four distinct aspects of a godly, hands-on faith that I want to talk about today. And first, this faith is based on service and not avarice. It's based on service and not avarice. Now, I realize that avarice is a word that some of you may not be familiar with. And so I'm going to unpack it for you. How many of you, first of all, know what avarice means? Thank you. My wife raised her hand. <laughs> avarice is the same in many ways as greed. Okay? But it also can be defined as like selfish desire. You want, you gotta have, you gotta get more and more and more. You're greedy for something. You gotta have this, this avarice. It, it just drives you. The Christian life is not based on that. What I can get out of it. It's based on service. What can I give to others? Are you gonna be blessed with it as a Christian? Absolutely. But your motivation for reaching out to others should not be about you. What can I get? Am I going to look good? It's about serving others. It's about reflecting God's love that He showed to you, to other people. We talked last week about checking your motivations for what you're doing. This is especially important when you're serving God because you cannot truly serve God and serve yourself at the same time. Look at Matthew 6.24. It says, No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Money being something you get for yourself. You could even change money there and say self. You cannot serve God and self. They're incompatible. When we serve, it's all about others. It's all about others and not about ourselves. Will we reap some benefits sometimes? Yes. But that's not the motivation. That's not why we do it. You know, Paul's ministry, as we've seen in here, He's done, God has used him in a lot of different ways. But one thing you have to look at when you see his ministry, it's never about money. It's never about Paul getting rich. It's never about him having a cushy life, is it? No. It's about reaching others for Christ. It's about blessing others. It's about encouraging the church. Look at um, Acts 20, 32-33. So we know that Paul is, Paul is leaving. He's going to Jerusalem. The Spirit is compelling him to go. And he says now, as he's talking to the, the leaders in Ephesus, from Ephesus, he says, Now I commit you to God and to the word of His grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And then he says something interesting. He says, I have not coveted anyone's silver, or gold, or clothing. You say, well, that's kind of out of context. Not if you remember what we talked about earlier. Because he was talking last week and the week before, he was talking about the fact that there are going to become some, there are going to be coming some people who are going to come there for a really specific reason. They want to pasture themselves on their own sheep, basically. They want to draw people away, make their own disciples. It's all about them. It's all about them rising in status, being the big dog, making, maybe making some good money in this process. Right? And Paul is saying, wait a minute. You know 
That's not what I ever did. I never came here coveting your money. I never wanted your silver. I never wanted your clothing. I didn't want anything from you. That was not why I came. Now, Paul is definitely an evangelist. He is definitely there to try to reach people. But he understood. He understood also that just telling them about Jesus, just telling them about Jesus was not the whole picture. He couldn't just do that. You know, you may have heard the statement before. People don't care how much you know until they see how much you care. People don't care how much you know until they really know how much you care. I mean, I can get up here and I can tell you, I can read the Bible and I can talk until I'm blue in the face about this. But you know what? Unless you see some evidence in my life of me trying to care for others, it's just words. On your campus, in your job, wherever you are, you can tell people about Jesus. You can tell people about your faith. But unless they see a difference in your life, it's just words. It means nothing. But until they actually see that there is some difference, that somehow it affects you, that your life has been radically changed. They're not going to believe. You know, we hear a lot about communism. Some of you have grown up with communism. And when the Russians in 1917 took over uh, the communists, excuse me, took over the Russian society in 1917. The communists came in. They didn't, as a lot of people suppose, say, go in and eliminate religion. In fact, they said, no, in our society, there is going to be freedom of religion. You can be a Christian, you can be a Buddhist, you can be a Muslim, doesn't matter. But they took the teeth away. Because they gave people freedom of religion. But they also told the church this. They said, you can, you can worship. But you can no longer do good works. See, the church had been doing things like caring for the elderly. Educating children. They had been housing orphans. They had been feeding the hungry. And the communists said, you can't do that anymore. You can't do those good works anymore. You can meet. People can come. But you can't do these things anymore. You know what the upshot of that was? 70 years into communism, the church, which had been a powerful force in society, was now seen as irrelevant. Why? Because there was no action. There might have been some faith on the part of some people, but there was no action. There was no outpouring of it. People couldn't see it manifested. One has to wonder if that church had just disappeared, would anybody really notice? And the big question for us is, if this church disappears, will anybody really notice? If all of a sudden this church closed its doors in heaven, would people even notice? Are we making a difference? Are we living our faith out loud? Are we somehow showing Christ through our activities, through our actions, through the lives of our members? Or are we irrelevant? Sobering thought. We must live our faith out loud. We must live in a way as Paul is saying, look, it wasn't about me getting anything. It was about me serving. It was about me showing Christ and what He's done in my life. 
and not about me trying to get anything from you. The second thing we see is that this hands-on faith, in addition to being based on service and not avarice, it's marked by practicality and not entitlement. Now, entitlement is another word that some of you may not understand that clearly, but it's a huge problem we have today. Entitlement means basically you believe that you deserve or are entitled to something. We have a lot of people in this world who believe that. That somehow... I deserve a better job. I deserve better treatment. I deserve a break today at McDonald's. Whatever it is. I deserve this. I deserve this. I deserve this. Guess what? You don't. Who says you deserve it? But we believe it. It's in our society that you're entitled to it. You deserve it. But the Christian faith, the hands-on faith, is marked by practicality and not entitlement. Not because you deserve it. It's the grace of God that you've got. It's the grace of God that you have anything. What Paul was sharing was life. It's not too much to ask, though, would it have been? Yeah, I mean, Paul could have said, I'm sharing life. Certainly, I am entitled to some special treatment. Here I am among you, you believers. Man, you should have put me up in a nice place. You should have given me, uh, you know, paid me a salary to do what I'm doing. You should have done all these wonderful things for me because I'm sharing eternal life with you. Wow, I deserve it, right? I deserve this. Yeah, Paul was sharing eternal life. That wasn't what Paul was after as far as money and things from that. Look at Acts 20, 34. He says, You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. I didn't cover your gold. I didn't cover your silver. I didn't cover your clothing. But I worked. These hands of mine were the ones that supplied the needs. Not only my needs, but this is what kind of stuns me. Needs of my companions too. Paul had a bunch of people with him. He had, he had others with him. But Paul's the one working. Paul's the primary preacher. Paul's the primary evangelist, but Paul's also the one working. You've got to wonder, what, is this, what are his friends doing? Why aren't they working? He's providing for their needs as well. while he's preaching, while he's trying to reach this church. So does that mean that the true man or woman of God shouldn't accept money for their service to the church? I shouldn't get paid. No, let's not go there. <laughs> Look what it says in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 5, 17-18. It says the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For Scripture says, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. By the way, this is Paul again talking. So, what's the double message here? No, it's not wrong to get no, it's not wrong to receive service, to receive something for what you're doing. But once again, it's the motivation and the practicality of it. You might say, it's okay for you, Pastor. I don't get paid anyway. I mean, I'm paid, but Dana, you don't get paid, do you, for what you do here? No, Scott? No, Timothy? All you people up here singing, you guys didn't get a paycheck for that, did you? Then he's saying, yeah. <laughs> no. But there is praise, right? There's recognition, there's status, there's things that come. There are other non-tangible rewards that come for service. 
And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's not wrong to accept these things, but they should never be widely served. We are entitled to reward, but you're wondering where practicality is coming in. A hands-on faith is marked, though, by practicality. We don't know with these other disciples why they didn't work. We don't know why the Ephesus church was not providing money for Paul. What we do know is that Paul is saying, you know, I did this with my own hands and for my companions. It was probably very practical. He was a trained tent maker. It was probably a very practical thing for him to do, for him to work to provide for these people. Paul stepped up. He didn't claim position. He didn't say, you know, you should pay me. No. That wasn't what it was all about. We don't take a position. We don't go into something and say, I'm only going to do this if I get paid. We go because God has said, this is what you're supposed to do. There is an interesting story that I read about this guy named Scott Foster. Probably everyone's dream come true, by the way. Scott Foster is a, a hockey fan. Everybody follow hockey? Everyone, anybody watch hockey? Not, not your sport, I realize that. But he was a big hockey fan. 36-year-old accountant in Chicago watching his favorite team, the Chicago Blackhawks, go and battle against the Winnipeg Jets. But there's a kind of a weird thing in hockey where they appoint people to be called emergency goalies. And usually that means you just get to sit in the press box and get free drinks. But in this one game, the regular goalie was injured. The rookie goalie who took his place got injured. And because Scott had played a decade ago in college at Western Michigan University, he had played goalie. He had been designated emergency goalie. He's just a fan. And suddenly it's like, Scott! Scott Foster, get down here on the ice! And so this guy, this accountant, gets down there, puts on the gear, gets on the ice, professional hockey game and he saves seven shots on goal he basically wins the game for his team he's given the the belt which is basically the MVP the most valuable player you know and all of the you know the sportscasters are going this guy's never played professional hockey before you know it's like, wow, talk about dream come true, right? Can you imagine going to your favorite sports event, you know? You're going out to see the Oklahoma City Thunder play, and suddenly they call and say, Hey, Alan, come on down and play. <laughs> like crazy, right? But the reason I like that story is it's a perfect example of what happens sometimes with Christians. Sometimes God calls us into a situation that we feel that we're totally unprepared for. We may not have the training, we may not have the background or whatever, and God says, hey, I want you to do this. This is a situation where I need you. And you step up. Paul is in a situation where he needs to work. For whatever reason, we're not told why, but he needs to work instead of just being paid. And he steps up. And Christians do that because it's marked by practicality. It's marked by the need. It's marked by this is what God needs for you right now. And you don't need to go on the fact that, well, no, I'm entitled. If I'm going to help out, I'm entitled to this or I'm entitled to that. We serve because God wants us to serve. The third thing 
that we see is that a hands-on faith does what needs to be done, but it's also exhibited in humility and not pride. Exhibited in humility and not pride. I've told this story before, but it's been a while. But back in January 30th of 1973, there was a U.S. Senator by the name of Senator John Stennis. He has had a hard day on Capitol Hill, comes to his Washington home, gets out of his car, heads for his front porch, and he's accosted by two teenage mothers who rob him and shoot him twice. He's rushed to the hospital. Now, you've got to understand something about John Stennis. This guy is a really important man in Washington. He is the chairman of the very powerful Armed Forces Committee. This is the era of, of um, the Vietnam War. He um, is also a very interesting person uh, from the standpoint he's a Democrat. He is a very staunch Southern Democrat at the time, uh, known for his strong stance on the Vietnam War, also known for his strong stance on racial segregation. He does not believe the races should mix. Uh, he votes against the Civil Rights Act. He is very much, you know, the blacks are here, the whites are here, this is the way it should be, like it's always been. But now this very powerful, very controversial, I guess, in some ways. Man is in the hospital. Also that night, driving home, is another senator who is about the exact opposite of John Stennis as you could get. He's an evangelical Christian from governor, from uh, former governor, excuse me. Evangelical Christian governor from Oregon who is now in the U.S. Senate. And they have butted heads all the time. This is Senator Mark Hatfield. Because Hatfield is against the war, and Hatfield is for civil rights. And, you know, he's just a complete opposite, really, of John Stennis. But as Hatfield is driving toward his house, the radio comes on and talks about John Stennis being in the hospital. So Hatfield turns his car around goes to the hospital and walks inside. And it's chaos because, you know, a senator, a U.S. senator's been shot and the phones are ringing and people are running everywhere, etc. And this is back in the days where they don't have those nice little answering machines on the phone that says, uh, you know, press this number, press that number, whatever. This is when they have switchboards. And a switchboard was this this big board with the little lights coming on, and you had to have an operator there who would press this and put it there, you know, to connect different people to different places and always had to answer the phone. Well, the switchboard operators are overwhelmed because everyone's calling in to trying to find out what's going on with the senator. And as Hatfield walks in, he notices that one of the switchboards is empty. There's just not enough people. So he doesn't say a word. Takes off his overcoat, walks over sits down, starts answering calls for hours. Finally, when after daylight's come, things have begun to get a little bit more calm, etc. Hatfield gets up, picks up his coat, introduces himself to the operator that he's been working next to all night, and walks out. No work. Of course, the media goes absolutely insane because here is Senator Hatfield, of all people, you know, this enemy of John Stennis, basically, who came in with no fanfare or anything else just to help out. But that's what Christians do. That's a hands-on faith. That's a faith lived out loud. Not about recognition, not about anything else, but a faith that is exhibited in humility and not perfect. Listen to what Paul says 
in Acts 20, 35. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Basically, what he's doing through this work, etc., he's showing them a way to live. He's showing that this is how it's done, people. This is a hands-on thing. Now, we can look at that and we go, well, Paul's statement, you know, you're pretty stuck on yourself, aren't you? This is kind of prideful. Not really. Because all he's doing is trying to drive home a point. He's saying, this is how you should live. This is how you should live in front of others. He's striving to be a shepherd, to teach a formerly pagan people about a hands-on faith. And he had a great model, didn't he? You remember Jesus. We all remember Jesus, right? But Jesus, with the disciples, right? What does he do? Last Supper, he takes off his outer garment, wraps a towel around his waist. He gets down and he takes the disciples' dirty, muddy, dusty feet. He washes them. He takes on the role of a servant, doesn't say anything. Just washes his disciples' feet. And then afterwards, he tells them what it was all about. He says, I've washed your feet, and you should do likewise. You need to serve people. This is a hands-on faith. This is not head knowledge, not just in your heart either, but in your hands, in your, in your voice, in your feet. It's living your faith. Not loud. But does Paul mean by what he just said? Does Paul mean that to be godly, one always has to put on the apron? One always has to have a wrench in his hand? Some, some pastors do that. Some Christians do that. They are excellent at fixing things and always jumping in there, etc. But there is a place and a time for these things. Look at Acts 6, 2 through 4. It is coming, I think. Do you have Acts 6, 2 through 4? Did we put it on there? Yeah, there we go. No. Acts 6. I'm sorry, maybe I didn't put that on your list. It's not on the sheet. Okay, there it is. Acts 6, 2 through 4. So, the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them. And we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Now, if you remember from our study of Acts, this was about the fact that a lot of the widows had been ignored, etc. There was needs, right? And rather than the, 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 the disciples, or the apostles, rather than saying, okay, that, there's something we got to do too. Instead, they delegated. They said, you know what? We've got to preach the Word of God. We, this is a huge responsibility for us. It's not that this isn't important. But we need somebody else to do it. You see, there's a time and a place. It's practicality that is coming along here. Because we're a body of Christ. We all work together. There is absolutely nothing wrong with me getting down and putting on a uh, smock and having a wrench in my hand and going trying to fix something. But it will probably still be broken by the time I'm done. Because I'm terrible at mechanical things. Scott, thank you very much. Okay? If you want me to fix something, like the air AC, you guys are going to burn. Because, you know, I, it's just not me. Okay? It's not practical for me to do that. That's not that I'm opposed to it. It's not opposed to, I'm not opposed to putting on an apron and working in the kitchen. But it's not always practical. 
for that man. True humility does not disregard practicality. Sometimes what is best is to let others who are more qualified do the job. But it's also letting others take the glory and letting them do sometimes the more important roles when that is seen as more practical. During the World War II, Winston Churchill was drumming up labor to basically support the war effort. And he said, basically, he said he, in a speech, he asked them to picture the mind, in their minds a parade which he knew would be held after the war in Piccadilly Circus. And he said, first of all, as this parade is going down, you're going to see the sailors, the sailors who had kept the vital sea lanes open. Then would come the soldiers who had come home from Dunkirk and, and then gone on to defeat Rommel in Africa. Then you'd see the pilots who had driven the Luftwaffe from the skies. You're going to see all these warriors. You're going to parade them. But behind them, marching, you're going to see these people with coal dust all over their faces. Long line of sweat-stained men and women walking along. And someone's going to cry out and say, well, where were you during the critical days of our war, our struggle? And from 10,000 throats would come the answer, we were deep in the earth with our faces to the cold. In other words, these were people that were unsung heroes, that were doing the other stuff. They might have said, okay, I'm going to volunteer, I'm going to the front. But instead, they were kept back to support the effort because that had to be done too. Hands on faith is exhibited in humility, but it includes the practicality. They are not mutually exclusive. Because remember, this is not about us. It's not about looking good, it's taking the best job or anything else. It's about Christ. It's about serving others. It's about doing what God has called you in the moment rather than what you feel you're entitled to or whatever. And fourthly, it's characterized by dependence and not independence. Now I'm talking specifically about dependence on God and not another form of independence. But it's basically our dependence on God and not thinking that we can somehow be independent to call our own shots here. Notice what Paul does in Acts 20, 36-38. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them. And prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was the statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. What I want you to see in this passage is what Paul does. Paul, in a very visible, tangible way, shows them that, you know what? I know I'm leaving. Now, I don't think Paul wanted to go. I think, I think Paul had been, spent three years, he'd gotten in these people's lives he loved them. Paul's being called to obey. He's being called to leave. And so as a shepherd, he warns them what's coming, etc. And then, in a very tangible way, he gets down on his knees and he prays with them. Showing them in a very clear fashion, hey, you and I, we are dependent on God. He is the one who calls the shots. Not us. I might love to stay with you, but that's not what needs to happen here. It's all about God and what He wants for our lives. A hands-on faith 
is one that recognizes our utter reliance on God for direction. The youth, I believe, have memorized this. You can probably say it, but let's look at Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. If you can youth know it, you can say it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him and He will make your path straight. We are to be dependent on God. We are to trust Him completely. We are to ask Him for direction and go wherever He wants us to go. So do we practice a hands-on thing? In this church, do you practice a hands-on faith? Because a hands-on faith is not just in our heads, it's shown in our words, in our actions, in our lives. It's based on service, not evidence. It's marked by practicality and not entitlement. It's exhibited in humility not pride. It is characterized by dependence and not independence from God. What kind of faith are you practicing? Let's pray. Father God, your word challenges us. shows us again and again that this is not just that knowledge. The true faith is one that is lived out loud. True faith is one that is hands on. Lord, help us not to just be head Christians. But help us to be whole body Christians. Help us to be those who truly live the life we've been called to live. We truly want to be your hands and your feet to this world. We don't mind if we're called to do the dirty jobs or if we're called to be right in front of everyone. Help us to serve in humility, God, and not pride. Help us to serve with practicality and not feel that somehow we're entitled to something better. Help it to be about others rather than ourselves. Help us to always rely on you. In Christ's name.